Hello, and welcome to Something New here at WCF Symphony. I'm Jason Weinberger, Pauline Barrett Artistic Director of the Orchestra. And after a year plus of all kinds of programming in digital format, we've of course moved back to live performances. We had a great summer of outdoor performances. And in fact, we have some more of that happening this fall as well as some indoor performances. And so live music is indeed back and thriving, but we thought we would use some of what we learned during the pandemic to bring you some digital enhancements that we hope will make your experience of our live concerts even more enjoyable. And this is the first of those, kind of a new format for our pre-concert talks. And I think we'll be doing this for many concerts and possibly even been doing some of these for um, the other things that aren't related to concert activity. Um, maybe we'll also bring in some conversation into the concerts themselves. So kind of um, taking away that separation of the pre-concert talk happening on the same night in a different room and letting you watch at your leisure before the concert, learning a bit more about the music on the programs. And then we can do some more substantive Q&A, stuff like that at the actual show. So we'll rely on your feedback to know what you think about all of this and um, let us know. Um, tell us when you come to the concerts and drop us a line by Facebook, by email, give us a call. Um, we're as accessible as we can possibly be, and we want to hear what you want to um, experience more of here at WCF Symphony. Now, today's conversation will cover our Serenata Noturna event that is taking place on October 16th. And this is a really delightful program of string serenade style music from the classical period in Europe, featuring music by Mozart, Michael Haydn, and Joseph Boulogne. And so we're going to hear some very familiar tunes and some things that are probably totally unfamiliar to you. So perhaps this is where uh, this, um, this segment can come in handy, giving you a bit of context for what you're going to hear. Now we're going to start with Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's serenade, popularly known as Eine Kleine Nachtmusik. And this is a piece that's just so famous that we, I think, sometimes lose sight of what it really is. Um, you know, the opening notes of this serenade are among the most famous notes in all of classical music. And the piece is just performed so frequently that we kind of become used to it as, as like a, a masterwork of, of the modern stage. Uh, but the goal with this concert is actually to give us an opportunity to reach back into Mozart's time and learn a bit more about what this music really is, because I think it really is something different than what we think it is today. And the other composers on this program and the music we're featuring by them helps illuminate this issue, as well as helps us understand more about the other composers who were working around Mozart that we often don't hear about, because after all, Mozart did cast, cast an enormous shadow. Uh, so anyway, uh, getting back to Eine Kleine Nacht Musik, um, a wonderful serenade for strings. So this is for four string parts, can be played by a string quartet, is most commonly played by a full string orchestra as we will do in our performance. Um, the title itself is where I wanna start because we, we call this piece Eine Kleine Nacht Music, I think we might assume that uh, that title designates something particularly special about the piece. Um, as is the case with most titles attached to classical pieces, uh, it really doesn't have anything to do with the origin of the work. Mozart kept a very careful catalog of his music, and in the catalog, he titled this piece Eine Kleine Nachtmusik. And the, the literal translation of that uh, from, from the German is a little serenade. Um, now we call it in English a little night music, but uh, a serenade in that time would have been understood by the contemporary population to be night music. Um, serenades, by their nature, were not meant to be performed in more formal settings, but instead at parties and social events. Um, and, and I'm sure many of these took place in the evening. Uh, and this is something that Mozart wrote for that type of occasion, we assume. We don't actually know why he wrote the piece. Uh, and in fact, it may even be incomplete. When we look at his um, catalog, we see this title, uh, which really doesn't mean anything. If this, if this was just called, you know, Serenade, uh, it would be like the rest of his serenades, and, and I don't think we would have a different view of it based just solely on the title. Uh, but he also notes in his catalog that there were five movements, and we only know the piece in its four-movement form. Now, we do know that many divertimenti and serenades were in 
um, five movement or six or seven movement forms. In fact, Mozart's greatest serenade, the wind serenade, we know as the grand partita, uh, that is a piece that has multiple extra movements over this four movement format. So I think it would have been, uh, would have been reasonable to assume that a serenade like this could have five or more movements. Mozart notes as much in his catalog, but we don't know what happened with that extra movement. Uh, there's been some debate about it. I don't think anybody's come up with anything conclusive on that topic. Um, we actually thought about uh, choosing a piece from Mozart's catalog to substitute as the fifth movement for this Eine kleine Nacht music performance. We decided against that. There weren't a lot of great options that convinced me and our um, musicians that we had discovered that missing fifth movement. So we'll leave the piece as it has come down to us in its form movement form. Now, I won't talk a lot about the context of the piece, excuse me, about the content of the piece, because I prefer to focus a bit more on the context for it. Again, trying to really get down to what was happening in Mozart's life, what was happening in Vienna in, eight, in 1787, when he wrote this wonderful, delightful serenade, seems almost like tossed off, undoubtedly for some, um, some commission, for some event, we just don't know for what. And it was during this period of time that Mozart was kind of going through a transition in his own life. Um, he had been very active as a performer in the earlier part of the 1780s. In fact, most of his income was secured that way, playing his own concertos in public. Uh, some of that activity and some musical activity in general was kind of snuffed out by the Austro-Turkish War that took place in the late 1780s. And that may be one reason why Mozart's output changed. Uh, but more significantly, he embarked on a series of really remarkable operas starting in the middle of the 1780s. These are known as the Da Ponte operas, the, the works that Mozart composed alongside the librettist Lorenzo da Ponte. And they are among not only Mozart's greatest works, but, but the greatest works of art in any genre. We're talking about uh, uh, Don Giovanni, um, Marriage of Figaro, Cosi fan tutti, these, these incredible operas um, that, are, that are more than music, more than drama. Um, they're just such huge achievements. And alongside these pieces, he's writing works like the Serenade that we're talking about here, which seems much lighter, much less consequential, but not less sophisticated. Um, so it's interesting to, to think about the different musical worlds that Mozart was navigating at this time. 1787 is also really a very interesting year for Mozart personally. Um, earlier in the year, in May of 1787, his father died. Um, and we know that Mozart's father, Leopold, played an enormous role in his life, throughout his life. Even after Mozart left Salzburg, where he grew up and moved to Vienna, um, Leopold Mozart just exerted a, a huge influence on his son. And so this was obviously a watershed event um, when Leopold Mozart died in 1787. I don't, I don't think it has anything to do directly with the serenade and its musical content, but it, it does help us understand kind of the phase of life that Mozart was in during this year. The serenade was written about four months later. And then at the end of the year, Mozart received his first and only official appointment from the court in Vienna. It's really hard to believe that a composer who was, he was literally world famous in his own time. Um, he's not one of those composers who was, you know, toiling in obscurity and then, and then became one of the greats, you know, in posterity. Uh, Mozart was a hugely famous child performer. Um, then, of course, as a composer, he was very well regarded. And during this period of time, his operas were catching fire in Prague. He was traveling to other cities this very year, doing concerts, presenting his music, making connections. All of that led to a feeling that perhaps Mozart might be enticed to leave Vienna. Um, he had not had some of the same success in Vienna with his operas. And, um, you know, there could have been a lucrative offer for him in one of these other places. So encouraged by that and maybe some other factors, he was um, offered a position at the court in Vienna, uh, a composer of chamber music, but really uh, primarily to write dance music. So um, that story brings us full circle back into the world of the serenade, the divertimento. Uh, because this is all music that was intended for something other, I believe, than a very intensely um, focused listening audience. Now, many concerts at the time, many operas at the time were played to houses that were pretty unruly by modern standards. Uh, but much of this other music, this dance music and serenade music, really would have been played at, at parties and social events. 
Um, and so for Mozart to have as his only official job in the capital there, a musical capital of Vienna, um, be composing dance music, uh, really does uh, help us understand how important this type of social music was to Mozart financially. And based on the kind of music he wrote when he went over to these serenades and, and divertimenti, um, he was also very artistically interested, um, engaged. Um, it doesn't seem like he was just tossing this stuff off to make a buck. So um, we have a, a really wonderful backdrop for this great serenade by Mozart. We're very excited to perform it for you at the Gallagher Blue Dorn and, um, and combine it here with some pieces by some other very interesting composers. So a great way to understand and think about what Mozart was doing with a piece that is now so famous to us, it's hard to um, situate it in the context that it comes from. Um, but one of the ways we really can do that is by looking at similar music by Mozart's contemporaries. And there's no contemporary of Mozart's, I think, who is as important and as revealing as the composer we're going to discuss next, Michael Haydn. Now, some of you are scratching your heads going, what? Let's talk about Franz Josef Haydn or Beethoven or Salieri or, you know, all these composers who were very much in Mozart's orbit. And certainly they were. I mean, in 1787, when Mozart wrote his serenade, um, he actually had his first encounters with Beethoven, who hoped to work with him. And, um, and you know, of course, he was in Vienna, you know, with constant contact with those composers who were circulating through that capital at the time. Um, Michael Haydn, by contrast, lived in Salzburg, but he had a long-standing relationship with the Mozart family. And there's a very close musical relationship as well between Mozart, who was younger, and Michael Haydn, who himself was a younger brother of Franz Josef Haydn. And of course, Franz Josef Haydn also men mentored Mozart. So this, um, these two families were very much bound together, both because of origin in Salzburg and also because of ongoing musical interests that all of these men had and shared and worked on together. So Michael Haydn, just a quick bit of biographical information, is the younger brother of Franz Josef Haydn came from a family in which music um, was encouraged. His father was a, a hobbyist folk musician, and he really wanted his sons to be well-versed in music, so he ensured that that happened. And all, all the wonderful music that those two composed um, is evidence of the success of that effort. Uh, Michael Haydn um, had a bit of a different career, though. Franz Josef Haydn um, went to Vienna, and so did Michael as a young man. They both studied there. And in fact, there's quite a bit of evidence suggesting that Michael may have even been the better of the two in school. Uh, then ultimately, Franz Josef Haydn ended up uh, becoming an employee, um, an esteemed employee at the court of Esterhazy. And that really provided him with the wherewithal to do many things he did in his career. But he also traveled widely. I mean, we have a whole set of symphonies by Haydn called the London Symphonies. And so um, you know, his music was very cosmopolitan in many ways, and his, his patronage um, uh, that he benefited from um, kind of came with the ability for him to be even more creative because there wasn't the same um, type of pressure that composers had when they were perhaps at a different court or especially when they were um, employed by a church institution. And that was the case with uh, Michael Haydn, much more so in Salzburg. Even though he did go to Vienna as a student and had some offers to work there and elsewhere, he decided to return to Salzburg. In 1762, he was hired as the concert master at the court in Salzburg, and he remained in that position for four and a half decades. It's incredible to think about, uh, about a musician like this, just you know, hitting that lifetime jackpot employment, but then staying there and, and building a whole body of work kind of inside of that institution. And so we see in Michael Haydn's work a, a really a series of clear splits. He's got uh, quite a bit of music that was written for the church. And of course, Salzburg was uh, uh, a center uh, of, of um, Catholic church hierarchy. And uh, he also wrote plenty of secular music, um, quite a few serenades and, and divertimenti uh, and symphonies, um, uh, choral works, all, all kinds of different things. So his, his output is is quite varied. We're going to zero in on the secular music he wrote because um, we know Mozart was familiar with it. There's 
There's, um, there's evidence that Mozart um, even, even wrote music um, based on Haydn's music or, or introductions to Haydn's music. Um, we see this coming out of the secular music that Michael Haydn wrote and coming into the young Mozart's music, because of course Michael Haydn was a bit older than, than Mozart. Um, and uh, we don't know, unfortunately, what the occasions were for many of these pieces, but we can hear in them uh, the clear mark of these secular entertainments, uh, because so many of the traits of these pieces carry across to, for example, Mozart's serenades in Vienna. So this, these formats, the divertimenti, this, the serenades, were um, definitely uh, among the most popular forms of entertainment during the time, and the aristocracy definitely um, wanted to have uh, new music like this at events that they hosted. Um, it, it really, uh, we, we would assume, uh, impressed people and um, uh, spoke to the sensibilities of the time. So we have Michael Haydn, 1782, he writes this divertimento that we're going to play. And this is a work that's very similar to Mozart's work in its shape. Uh, a little bit different though in Michael Haydn's approach, but it's, it's a four movement work for four string parts. And again, it could be played by a string quartet, but most commonly these types of divertimenti are played by a small string orchestra. And again, that's how we'll be performing it. Um, the movements themselves are a bit different. Michael Haydn, um, I think, is a little bit more idiosyncratic composer, uh, but we hear him, I think, exploring um, some things he could do in secular music that would not necessarily have been called for in church music. And so I imagine for him, this was an opportunity for some experimentation and uh, have a little fun in the music. And that's what we're gonna try and do with our performance. We wanna make this fun, uh, because after all, the word itself, divertimento, you know, it just, it just, it, it, it should be uh, um, light and freewheeling, and you know, there should be places in the music where the audience chuckles. Um, you know, those types of things uh, we lose sometimes in concert music, and we have a more formal atmosphere for this music today. So uh, what we're gonna do in this performance is try and make listeners feel as if they're at a, you know, an 18th century entertainment. Um, we can't um, necessarily recreate uh, the whole scene, but you know, within the, within the confines of our concert hall, we want you to feel kind of the origins of this music. I also think hearing um, Haydn's divertimento alongside Mozart's serenade really does give us some wonderful insight into what was being heard at these social events during the 18th century. Now, I don't want to confuse people to, to make you think um, that, you know, a vast majority of the population was hearing this music. That certainly was not the case. Uh, however, we can um, guess that uh, because of the diversity of types of events that we know these composers wrote music for, that maybe a wider cross-section of society um, was encountering Mozart's music in some of these places than, say, at court. Same thing with, with Haydn. Um, so lots of things to think about as we get into this music that's, that's very similar alongside Mozart. It's very much in the Austrian serenade tradition of social music, a piece by Michael Haydn, precedes our performance of the Serenade by Mozart. So now we come to the third piece in our program, a Sinfonia Concertante by Joseph Boulogne, also known as Chevalier de Saint Georges. Um, and you're going, hey, this guy's got two names and this other name sounds like he's royalty. What's the story here? Well, it's an absolutely incredible story and there's no way I can, I can rehash the whole thing for you in this setting. So I recommend dropping by at least the Wikipedia entry for this composer. Um, it's a page turner and I know most pages on Wikipedia are not page turners, but it's, it's incredible. His life story is just absolutely amazing. So I suggest you do a little reading and maybe even listen to a bit of his music before the show. It'll give you a really great appreciation for who this individual was and also why he's on the concert. Uh, but to get back to his life, it, it's useful just to have some background. Um, he was born in uh, Guadalupe, which, is, which was a, a French colony in the uh, Caribbean. Uh, it was made up of several different islands in the Caribbean. Um, and he was the uh, son of a French nobleman and uh, that individual's slave. Um, this probably was not that uncommon at the time, but his father acknowledged him as his son and brought him to France to be educated. And that probably did not happen as much during this period of time. So, so um, Boulogne is really an interesting story, just historically, the, the look he gives us at colonization during the 18th century and you know, what happened with people. You know, many folks um, 
um, were really never acknowledged in terms of their family history, and others like Boulogne um, benefited greatly from it. So, so it is an interesting story in that regard. What happened to him in France is even crazier. Uh, he got involved in fencing, became one of, if not the greatest fencer in Europe by the time he was in his mid to late teens. So, um, you know, we don't normally hear stories like that about composers. He was obviously well educated in music. And he fought in the French Revolution in the first all-black regiment fighting on the side of the Republic in, 17, uh, in late 1780s. So uh, this guy, is, his life could make an incredible, incredible movie, and I'm surprised it hasn't been done. Maybe that'll be forthcoming here sometime soon, and then everyone will know more about him and his music. But we will zero in just a bit on him as a musician. He was widely known around Paris and around Europe as a performer. Um, gifted violinist, um, conductor, so he was leading orchestras. Uh, the conductor at this time wasn't yet a fully fleshed out profession. Usually a violinist, a lead violinist of the orchestra would conduct, uh, or, or maybe like in Mozart's case, uh, he might conduct from the piano. So, uh, so Saint George, uh, or excuse me, Joseph Boulogne, <laughs> even, even I forget to call him by his real name, and that's what we're sticking with, just using his given name. Uh, that's what we do with all composers across the spectrum. Uh, in our program books and our, you know, our talks and stuff like that. So we'll stick with Joseph Ballone, but uh, you may hear him referred to as Chevalier de Saint George. Um, in any case, he he became so um, uh, well regarded as a composer that he was, uh, uh, excuse me, as a conductor and a performer, that he was essentially one of the top performers in Paris, leading um, one of the very best orchestras in that city. He was even um, proposed as a um, director for the Paris Opera, which is just incredible when you think about it during this time. Um, his race did sink his candidacy for the Paris Opera, and so that in itself is an interesting story to look at. Uh, but he continued to perform with a number of notable ensembles. And one of the things he would have done with uh, these types of groups in Paris is perform all of the popular uh, musical forms. And we see that when we talk about Mozart and Michael Haydn, how they would gravitate towards forms that were um, really esteemed where they were, where they could make some money, where they could make connections. And so certainly, um, certainly Joseph Boulogne in writing his um, Symphonia Concertanti realized that he was dipping his toe into a very popular format. The Symphonia Concertante um, is a piece that sort of comes out of the earlier um, uh, Baroque concerto. So think about the, think about the Brandenburg concertos. Um, this is a, a piece where we have um, a group of musicians, a small orchestra, and then often multiple soloists who perform both an ensemble role and a solo role. And these pieces differ a little bit from a traditional concerto, and there's not quite the same focus on a single soloist. And the, the kind of exchange uh, musical conversation that goes on between the soloists in a Sinfonia Concertante and the orchestra can be a little bit more intensive. They can also sound like concertos. Mozart wrote um, several Sinfonia Concertanti, and those sort of lean more towards the concerto side. I think in this case, in the music of Joseph Boulogne and many of the other Parisian Sinfonia Concertanti, um, we see something that is a little bit closer to that Baroque ideal, more of that back and forth conversation between the soloists and the rest of the ensemble. In this case, that ensemble is a string section, and the two soloists are the leaders of the two violin sections. So they're, they're playing along with the rest of the section, then suddenly they break out and play solo, and then they're back in the rest of the section. And I really love how that format bridges the history of this time from a musical perspective. Thinking back to the Baroque concerto, seeing it evolve into what eventually became the much more grand solo concerto, um, and seeing what different composers did with it in different regions. And also knowing with Boulogne that, you know, this for him was, was similar, in, I think, in many ways to what Haydn and, and Mozart were doing, or really scoring points with the secular music audience. Uh, because Boulogne would have performed this piece himself with colleagues from the orchestra. This is how people would have gotten to know him as a musician. He was writing his own chance to shine. Um, and that is something that makes him similar to Mozart and Haydn. But the music itself is, is so different that we really get a glimpse at, at a different form entirely that was heard in secular settings during this part of the 18th century. So I hope that provides for you as a listener in the concert um, a really great opportunity to get a more fine-grained and sort of colored in idea of the history of this period. So, so let's say, you know, we look at those old black and white photographs of early 20th century, and they get colorized now using this, this great computer technology 
and, and you can sort of colorize a photo and, and re restore the colors to it, I guess, in, in essence. They always look a little artificial, but it is interesting to compare with the black and white and just think about how we perceive things differently when we have more of that color. I think the same is true in music. When we just listen to Mozart, and we just focus on the masterpieces, I believe what we're really hearing is all of this music from this period in black and white. Um, we're not getting a really multifaceted uh, uh, view of, of what happened during the period. My hope is that this concert is a colorized version of that black and white music. That when you hear these pieces together, they come to life in a way they wouldn't when they're isolated, and, and particularly the opportunity to hear some lesser known works by some very interesting historical characters, um, really I hope should illuminate your experience of the music in concert. So let us know if that's the case. Let us know if you like this format. Uh, we'd love to keep using this as a way to get information to you well ahead of the concert and make our concerts and the information around them more accessible. We'd love to hear from you. Just, just drop us a line um, by Facebook, by email, um, whatever works best for you. So I look forward to seeing you at the concert. Very excited about this wonderful evening of serenade music on October 16th, Serenata Noturna.